All right. Um, welcome to week six of uh, BSAD 111. Uh, we're ready for our, our last interview. We've been uh, uh, having some great business in, uh, business professionals come in, and we've interviewed them over the last uh, last uh, four weeks. And so today we're going to end it off with a bang. We've got uh, Charlie Cologne here. Charlie is uh, the owner and uh, manager, franchise runner of Chick Fil A here in Lincoln, Nebraska. So uh, we're really excited to have him here today. We just got finished with an interview with um, our in-person class and uh, just had a great time with Charlie there. Uh, Charlie's a friend of mine, uh, knew him at Gallup, and um, uh, chose him because I wanted him to talk about um, this new role that he's taken on in the last couple of years as an entrepreneur, uh, a first-time uh, you know, business owner uh, with, with the Chick-fil-A. Prior to that, worked many, many years at Gallup. And uh, so I knew that I would be able to, uh, you know, work off of his top five strengths so that we can kind of talk about his success in college and think about that uh, from that strengths based perspective, but also be able to explore this whole um, new venture of his in, in entrepreneurship, which you guys just finished this last week taking the EP10. And so uh, I was just telling our friends over in the, uh, uh, in the in-person class in the lecture that, um, boy, if you've got uh, uh, risk tolerance and a profit orientation, I want you to think about starting a business. It might not be the exact right thing for you, and I want you to make the appropriate decision for you, but if there's any interest in that, I would really uh, encourage you to think about the possibility of, of uh, diving into a business because one of the things that we're doing here at the Clifton Strengths Lab is we're trying to encourage folks and identify folks that might uh, uh, be those people that can go out and start businesses uh, with the idea that you would generate jobs. We know that that's going to be the one thing that probably fixes America. Uh, a lot of the issues that we have in the states, uh, more so than anything, is job creation. And so we want to encourage you to think about that. And Charlie's a great representation of that. How many employees do you have at Chick-fil-A? We're at 93 right 93 now. 93 people that are that are running that business. It's been wildly successful, maybe yeah, even more so than Charlie expected, even with his positivity in his top five. And uh, uh, and certainly I think it's probably created a set of headaches uh, as well as just, you know, celebration on as successful as you've been, but you had no idea that, that it was going to be quite as successful as it has been. Is that no, right? No, there, there's a lot of moving parts. There's yeah. no doubt. It, uh, you know, it's one of those things where you knew the brand was strong mm -hmm. and you knew the market was ready. Mm -hmm. And um, they're just, Lincoln's a town that needs more restaurants. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I think has been really inspiring is just our customer base. Mm -hmm. And whether they're coming from Kearney or Hastings or, you know, just driving through off of IED and they have to stop at Chick-fil-A because that's what they eat. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a great set of customers. That's great. Charlie, why don't you share with us your top five, and then I want you to kind of move right into talking a little bit about your college experience. Um, Charlie played baseball for the for the Huskers and uh, had a great, great four-year career um, uh, uh, playing baseball, so he's got that piece. I know uh, many of our online students are actually athletes, hmm. so um, uh, they're, they're taking this course online because uh, the lecture or something else conflicted with them, uh, you know, uh, with their practices. And so we have a number of athletes that are actually taking the, the online course. So share us your top five, uh, and then give us a sense about when you started to recognize your strengths playing themselves out with, even within your college career, and maybe how that kind of, you know, gave you some direction as you thought about, you know, your career moving forward. Sure. So, uh, maximizer, belief, positivity, arranger, context are my top five. And I think, um, you know, looking back, I wish I would have had those words and the mm -hmm. um, definitions to help give some context to that. But I know, I, I can remember people using words like, you're very driven, um, nothing's ever good enough, you're always, you know, glass is always half full. Mm -hmm. Those types of words that associated themselves with those strengths and themes. Mm -hmm. uh, how it played out in college, I think, Mark was probably twofold. One was um, I was very driven in terms of uh, workouts and my goal of trying to get to the next step. Mm -hmm. And so uh, always making sure that my schedule, when maybe others decided that on the weekend they were going to go shop or party and hang out or whatever, I wanted to make sure that I was studying and getting all my workouts in. Mm -hmm. And so I think at the time, um, I didn't know that was Maximizer, but after I learned my top five, I knew that's what it was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The positivity component, uh, I think my dad and maybe some of my coaches would say that I always had a short uh, memory for when things didn't go well. 
And so always thinking about or trying to build upon what did go well, um, remembering positive at-bats or positive pitch counts or good pitches that I threw in certain situations um, was one of those things that just kind of came naturally. And so even though I didn't have the definition, it played itself out very naturally over the course of um, my career. I think one of the things that has always struck me, I, I wish, hindsight being 2020, right, I wish that I would have known my top five and had some clarity around um, complementary partnerships. Who could I have bounced ideas off of that wasn't like I was? Or what are the things that I do really well and how do I do more of those? And what are the things don't I do well and how do I find a partner to do those or, or be able to push those aside? Because I do think at times we're taught that we can be all things to all people all the time. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you stay the course on, on your top five, I personally believe that your upside is tremendously more valuable um, than the latter. Yeah, sorry about that, Charlie. I kind of interrupted you. I'm getting some alerts on my screen because I forgot it's to shut good. stuff off before we got started. So sorry, folks. It's all good. Uh, let's see. So um, yeah, and and we've talked about this too um, uh, with the students. I've tried to share with uh, uh, with all the students the, this whole idea of well-roundedness as, as an individual, and that we're looking more for well-roundedness as a team. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and in fact, I'm looking for more sharp, pointy people. Uh, when, when I think about an individual strengths. Sure. And so that's, that's a piece that, uh, that we've talked about. So thanks for, for, you know, kind of reinforcing that. And, um, so let's see, uh, also tell us about maybe, uh, uh, where there are times in your college career where you could feel like maybe your strengths probably backfired on you a little bit. And, mm -hmm. and we've talked a little bit with the students about raw versus mature. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we've identified talents that they possess, but it's up to them to figure out how to develop them into strengths. Sure. So can you think about, uh, times at, and points in time where you're like going, yeah, this was getting ahead of me or it wasn't really helping me be productive and getting to a positive outcome. Yeah, I mean, I think at times, especially with Maximizer, I'm not sure I, I never, I'm not sure I had the best balance at times. Mm -hmm. um, and by balance, I mean managing or balancing those relationships, balancing sports and academics. So I think what I tended to do because I was a Maximizer is I was very driven on workouts and making sure that I, I needed to get done everything that I needed to get done, but I, I'm not sure that I probably harvested some of the relationships that I should have. Mm -hmm. And so in thinking about how that potentially got away from me, that was probably one of them. That was one area that probably sacrificed a little bit. Um, it, that's, that's a great question, though. I mean, and in thinking about all of the relationships that I have now, I still mm -hmm. have a lot of those college buddies of mine, and we'll still mm -hmm. have lots of conversations. But I think if I would have gone back, um, or could share some advice with my younger self. One of the questions you posed earlier, it's figure out a little bit better balance, mm -hmm. you know. Um, that, that's a great question. Yeah, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just kind of jump around here but just because this kind of offers the opportunity. But um, uh, we talked in, in the lecture a little bit about uh, your time, you know, what you do every day. I, I wanted you to share, uh, and, I, and I, I think it's a good time for us to just jump right to that because um, uh, Charlie shared earlier that, what it's 60 percent at 60 least of your time is really mm -hmm. people time so you know so he owns this chick-fil-a he's responsible for it being profitable uh and growing and i think you got like a 20 percent is it a 20 percent revenue goal or a, like gr growth year over year it is it's 18 to 20 18 for 20 is it revenue or profit uh both both okay mm -hmm. so wow so um a pretty high bar set there so there's he has to be very focused on this on this business aspect and yet uh, Charlie, talk about what you do every day. What 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 yeah, consumes the, most of your time? Yeah, that was a fun question. So I would say the vast majority of my time, sixty to seventy percent, is is spent with people, and whether that's um, customers, employees, um, the vast majority of that is probably employee one on one time or team time. And so whether that's a team member, a team leader, a director, kind of anybody and everybody, I feel like I need to have people in the restaurant that I can trust implicitly. Mm -hmm. And that's everybody from point A to point Z. And so I, not only do I do all the interviews um, to bring people on board regardless of position, I just think it's really important. I wanna, I wanna get to the heart and minds of what people are thinking, what are their challenges, what are the opportunities, because they're gonna see the business from different angles uh, than I will. And so building that trust relationship with them and you know, knowing their kids' names and knowing where their husband and, and daughters and mm -hmm. wives work mm -hmm. and birthdays and those things are really important to me. The other 20%, 30%, 40%, um, you know, it's now that we're settling in a little bit, we're trying to do some community things. 
And, um, you know, the other 10 or 15% is tactical stuff. It's mm -hmm. making sure people have punched in on time yeah. and, and making we got sure plenty we, of chicken. We, got, we got plenty of chicken. That's right. Payroll, yeah. those kind of tactical things that are a must, you have to do them. Mm -hmm. But um, I try to always make sure that the vast majority of my time is people based. Yeah. Now, what I thought was interesting is that we even branched off in this conversation. I can't remember if it was one of the questions that we were talking about, but um, uh, that brought this out. But even in consideration of just the, a lot of that tactical, you know, process type stuff that has to happen for um, a Chick Fil A to open every day at the right time and and provide food, you know, have the food ready uh, uh, and make it, you know, really good food and at the same time safe. Mm -hmm. And we know that you know there's certain certain risks that you can have dealing with chicken and um, uh, so how does that relationship piece play into food safety yeah that's a great question I mean I think obviously food safety has been in the news for many many years but more recent uh, more recently um, with a few issues and I think you know you can have a process on how to cook chicken and mm -hmm. hold temperatures and hold times and those things but I think we're all of the opinion in the chain that um, and in many organizations, and I think the data would, would lend itself to that mark, that the more highly engaged, the more likely you are to have someone that goes the extra mile or that cares mm -hmm. uh, just a little bit more than the average. Mm -hmm. And we're not in business just to be good or, or to meet standards. We're in business to exceed um, expectations and standards. And I think that's one of the things that Chick-fil-A has done a very good job at in terms of checks and balances mm -hmm. and things that we need to do throughout the course of the day. But at the end of the day, it's still people doing those processes. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I will bet on somebody that's wildly engaged in their job to do those mm -hmm. correctly and with care and concern versus somebody that's not. Yeah, and we've talked with the students about those folks that are working out of their strengths. Uh, you know, Charlie's talent spotting every time he interviews somebody and trying to figure out, okay, this person's got talent and they've got motivation and, and uh, you know, they seem like they want to work hard and we always mm -hmm. got to get that hard worker piece in. Uh, but then I'm sure you're, you're thinking about, okay, are they going to be the right person for this role? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, what we've told the students and, and what I'll remind you now, and this kind of falls in line with with Charlie's talking about, even about food safety and making sure that we're serving a product that uh, isn't going to endanger the folks that we're, that we're feeding is that uh, you're much more likely to uh, be accurate and to do the job right over and over and over again if you're energized by the work that you get to do. Mm -hmm. And so if Charlie's good about picking somebody that's going to be good on the line uh, versus somebody that might be better, uh, you know, front of, you know, you know front of house, front of house mm -hmm. you know, taking orders, et cetera, uh, work, in the, uh, work in the dining room, et cetera, then um, uh, he's got a much better chance of having those folks engaged in what they're doing and always looking for opportunities to go that extra mile. And, mm -hmm. uh, and you even described it a little bit as a Disney experience. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to explain that a little bit. Yeah, so the, you know, the, the mission of Chick-fil-A is really straightforward. And Truett Cathy, who uh, started the business in 1946, really espoused the mission, and we still hold it today, which that being um, to glorify God by being a faithful steward of all that's entrusted to us and have a positive influence on all that come in contact with Chick-fil-A. Mm -hmm. Very large mission for the organization. We did what we call a mission follow-on for Chick-fil-A South Point, um, that being we want to be the we want to be the destination restaurant for South Point and for all of Lincoln by creating a Disney-like experience for everybody that walks through the door every day mm -hmm. and treating people as if they're staying at the Ritz-Carlton whereby, ladies and gentlemen, serve ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. And I think for us, Mark, it just gets back to um, having that global mission but thinking locally, right? Mm -hmm. And so the Disney component for us is everybody's on stage every day, mm -hmm. right? We want them wearing a smile. We want them... Um, sharing a smile, creating eye contact, speaking enthusiastically, and connecting mm -hmm. with people um, in an authentic way. Mm -hmm. And I think we've all been in situations where we've gone into a retailer and the person will read a script and they're probably trying to connect, but they don't really. And I think one of the things that we're trying to do every day is really connect with the heart and soul of people because we believe that every single person that walks through those doors, we can change their day a little bit or a lot. Yep. Yep. And so that works back in, you know, Charlie has belief in his top five and and I was joking with him uh, a little bit before. It's like, you know, this mission and purpose. So I want to talk about that. You know, that's one of these questions that I've been, that you guys asked yourself. You asked somebody uh, when you interviewed them with the Gallup Purdue Index, but the mission or purpose of my company makes me feel my job is important. And I was joking with Charlie, chicken, you know, <laughs> mission around chicken. But you've heard that you've heard at least some of that, you know, some of what he was just sharing that in terms of 
uh, the experience that they want to create for, for the people that come into the store, that they leave there not only with, you know, a great chicken sandwich and some awesome waffle fries, uh, but as well um, uh, that their, their day is just a little bit better. And uh, anything that you'd add to that in terms of that mission piece that you think about? Yeah, I mean, Truett always said that we're not in the chicken business, we're in the people business. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so true. It gets people thinking beyond just that transaction. You know, how can we uh, really make a personal connection? Because at the end of the day, we want people to come back, uh, but we want to get to know them by name. We want to know what their order is. We've got some of the same folks that roll in every day, multiple mm -hmm. times a day, actually, which was mm -hmm. new for me thinking about wow. quick service. But you know, I think that line is so important. We're not, it, it's more than chicken. Mm -hmm. It is more than chicken. We're in the people business. Okay. Uh, just real quickly, I wanted to touch on some of that GPI stuff again, uh, especially those those six, the big six that we've talked about with the students and, and that they've been thinking about. And um, so, you know, if we think about them in two groups, there's the one where it's really about relationships. And I want you to think about, you know, a mentoring relationship, um, and a professor that made you excited about learning. Share with us a little bit about relationships that you had on campus that significantly impacted you in terms of how you think about your, your career thus far. Well, I've certainly had a professor here at UNL named Fred Luthans that I think was a, a big motivator and a big influencer. Mm -hmm. And I think Fred was the type of teacher that was very dynamic. And what I mean by that is mm -hmm. not only was he a thought expert, but he expected you to put that into application. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, Mark, the reason that became so important is he forced us to think about how we would implement some of those concepts in a business or to do case studies and really put yourself into that company and create some solutions. Mm -hmm. And I think it's easy to read case studies, regurgitate them, and then kind of do a uh, you know post-mortem. But Fred's challenge was let's read these and learn from them and what would you do and make a case for that just like you were the CEO. Mm -hmm. And so he was somebody that always challenged, um, I felt like challenged thoughts, beliefs, and also was an industry expert in, in um, positive social interactions at, at work. Mm -hmm. um, outside of work, I think I've always really tried to um, bounce ideas off people. And so I think sometimes it's a little bit intimidating to think that you have to go up and ask somebody, hey, Mark, will you be my mentor? Mm -hmm. um, I like what you said earlier, which is exactly where I've operated. Hey, can we go grab a cup of coffee and I can ask you a few questions about life, mm -hmm. liberty, and the pursuit of freedom? You know, I mm -hmm. mean, um, and so I've done that in a number of different arenas, certainly recently in moving from corporate America into more of an entrepreneurial role. But I think over the course of my life, I probably had 50, 60, 70 people that I would call mentors, whether it was coaches, whether it was my father and grandfather, whether it was Roger Lipson at Gallup, whether mm -hmm. it was Jane Miller. I mean, there's a host of people that you would consider um, mentors, Jim Krieger being one of those as well. I mean, there's lots of people that are really good at what they do and to go glean a little bit of knowledge from them mm -hmm. and their life experience, I think is just wildly important. None of us know all the answers, right? right. But getting some truthful, um, authentic feedback from people that you trust and for people that you know will give you an honest answer, mm -hmm. I think is huge. Mm -hmm. Uh, I also mentioned in the in the lecture that I think you know there can be um, all kinds of roles that people that we that we call mentors you know and just like Charlie said let's let's start it with just you know hey let's grab a cup of coffee and see where this goes uh, but they can be people that promote you people that give you good advice people that can you know kind of help you rebound from uh, from a hit that you've taken uh, and those those three roles can all be separate people. You know, so don't don't get locked into this. I was, the joke that I was saying was that it's not some sensei sitting on the top of a mountain in the in the lotus position. You know, espousing wisdom, uh, but but broaden your your concept of mentorship and start to think about those people that already contribute to your life and just think about hey, what questions could I ask them or what ways do you think that they might be? They seem to be a fan of me. Uh, they seem to really want to support me, and uh, how can I give them a better shot at being able to do that uh, just by offering, you know, the opportunity to get together over a cup of coffee? Maybe. Definitely. Good. Anything else that you'd add, uh, you know, just as we've, we've thought about, um, you know, the role that you're in now, uh, where they are sure. now, freshmen in, in college, uh, uh, you know, uh, just discovering what their strengths are and thinking about that in terms of they move, as they move forward with their college career. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, obviously – you guys are in a very competitive marketplace as you go out and search for jobs, uh, careers. There's lots of jobs out there. Um, I think your challenge will be how do you find something that becomes a career, a hobby, um, a love, and a passion. And I think 
uh, if you can do that, I think it ultimately will hinder back and correlate to how you're utilizing your top five every day. Mm -hmm. um, I have no doubt that there's lots of jobs. You guys are all wildly talented people that come with a set of technology skills that will be very transferable. Mm -hmm. But you will find and unlock that passion, energy, and that uh, exponential capability when you can get into a job that leverages what you do well. And I always use the, the Gallup analogy, Mark, you know, if you write your name with your dominant hand, how easy that feels. Mm -hmm. And if you were asked every single day when you go to work 50, 60, 70 hours a week to write with your non-dominant hand, that's going to get old pretty quick. Oh, yeah. And so just that flow, the ability to just to be who you are, right? Mm -hmm. Bring all of you to work every single day. I really think that that gets unlocked when you have your top five in mind. Awesome. Thanks so much, Charlie.